We're quickening everything because we want to pray. Amen. Unanimous complaint from the last retreat was that you didn't have enough prayer, enough time to pray. What a complaint. You can complain about those, those kind of things all eternity. And I think we're going to go to like 6 o'clock. Okay? Uh, reason why we couldn't go, we had to end like 4 o'clock. Was it 4 or 3 or something like the last retreat was because there was Sunday service, but tomorrow is Saturday or two morning, not two morning. This morning, today is Saturday. So after we finish, we don't have a Sunday service, so we can go to like 6 o'clock. We're going to pray till about 6 o'clock, and we're going to sing some heavenly praises to our God. But till then, we want to do some serious praying, okay? praying of the serious kind, something like that. That's what we're going to do. And uh, can we turn to Ezra, chapter 8? So you can learn perseverance in prayer. Learn how to persevere through prayer. Some of you won't feel like praying. More than half of your life when you want to pray, you won't feel like praying. Then, so every time you won't feel like praying, you're not going to pray. So what we're going to do is we want to learn how to pray. Learn how to persevere. That's what we want to do tonight. That's what lock-ins are for. And if you persevere, you grow a little bit. Ezra chapter 8. This is not the text that we're going to dwell on today. But... I'm, we're just going to look at a lot of places, but this is one of the texts that we will use as a first point. So that's where we're turning here. Ezra chapter 8. What is this? Is it raining? Shower is a blessing. <laughs> okay. Now I, think, I don't think we ever had this, pro this before, huh? Was there ever experience? Do, do, have you ever experience of raining? That's interesting. Okay, Ezra chapter 8. Oh. Wait, let's pray. <laughs> I'm going to talk about prayer and we're not praying. <laughs> Father, we praise you and thank you for this time. We thank you that you have given us this time. Father, we thank you for my brothers and sisters, your beloved. We thank you for your presence. We pray that we will hunger after you with no other passion, undivided heart, seeking after you. And we want to grow. We want to have hunger. Lord, help us to pour out whatever that fills our hearts, that doesn't help us to get closer to you. So there will be clean, one heart, clean heart, to seek after you, to get closer to you, wanting more of you, addicted to you, lust after you. And we pray that you'll give, give us that kind of insatiable desire, passion, to love you and seek after you. May you become our joy today. May you become what we are seeking for. May, we, may you become what we enjoy today. More than anything we enjoy, more than any entertainment, help us to enjoy you. Help us to love you. Help us to seek you. Help us to hunger after you. And we pray that that will be the sole desire, sole passion within our hearts. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some people are asking, am I going to pray for people? I was thinking about Praying for freshmen, but I decided not to. I'm think, I think I'm going to pray for the graduates. Okay? That's what, what we want to do. Sorry, guys. It takes, you got to be there to be prayed for. <laughs> just kidding. But I think I, I'm going to pray for the, I want to pray for the graduates. I just want to bless you. Okay? God has 
uh, God has given me a privilege to bless people as a pastor of the church. What a glorious privilege as a shepherd to bless sheep. You know. So that's what I'm going to do. Glorious privilege of blessing. The ones who are going, seniors who are going away, not seniors who are staying. Or transfers. Or people like that. Okay? That's what I'm going to do. Or graduated ones, super duper seniors or whoever, going away. Well, uh, God, I don't know why, for a few weeks, God has been convicting my heart to pray for you, so that's what, what I'm going to do. Okay? Rest of us, we need to learn how to persevere. So, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some passage in the scripture that talks about fasting and praying. Fasting and praying. I know some of you will probably fast through this week, Passion Week that is coming. And this Sunday, I was going to talk about family, but I'm not going to talk about family. But I am going to talk about what Jesus did throughout the week. So we're going to follow those days. And you can have some ideas what to think, what to reflect and think about. And passages will be in the bulletin on Sunday. So you will know what to do, uh, how to pray and when, when to pray and what to think each day. And, uh, you know, Lord willing, God will give you some desire to fast after today. But that's what we're going to talk about, fasting and praying. Fasting, many places in the scripture, how important fasting is. Fasting. And when we look into the scripture, always fasting is related with prayer. Fasting and praying. We need to learn the importance of this as we look into the scripture. But not only do we need to look into the scripture, but we need to do it to understand how, what kind of awesome privilege it is. It's not an obligation, it's a privilege. It is one sense obligation, but more than obligation, privilege. And as we talk about it, you will want to fast, I think, but when you are fasting, you don't want you know, <laughs> to fast. But when you listen to the message, you will want to fast. Because fasting, if fasting is easy, everybody will do that. It's good for health, you know, it's good for a lot of things. Well, we're going to talk about it's necessity of fasting and praying, always related. Because fasting will strengthen your prayer. If you do it right, that is. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Why do we need to fast and pray? Why do we need to pray today? Why do we need to fast this week? And perhaps for the rest of our lives. Not continuously, but you know. There are a few reasons why we need to do it. First reason, hey, I'm going to talk about seven reasons why we need to fast and pray as we look into these verses. And as we look into Ezra chapter 8, here's the first reason. Hey, safety, safety of journey. For safety. For our safety. Look at Israelites are returning to Jerusalem from captivity. And this is what it says in Ezra chapter 8, verse 20, I, I don't have time to explain all the context. We want to quickly do this and get to prayer. But it says, there by Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast, chapter, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, so that we might humble ourselves before God and ask Him for our safe journey. For us and our children with all of our possessions. I was ashamed to ask king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks, on, looks to him, but his great anger is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. So Israelites are going on a journey back to Jerusalem to build the kingdom of God again. And it's a dangerous journey. There are thieves and robbers and there's, these are weak people just coming out of captivity. And how can they be protected? Without the strength of God, there's no way. So they had to fast and pray as a nation, as people of God, as a church of God, as a body of Christ. They had to fast and pray together for the safety of the journey. 
as I was thinking about this point, I was thinking about inner city missions team. Amen? <laughs> inner city missions team going on uptown. Dangerous places. You think you'll be safe by accident? And you think you have been safe by an accident and up to this time of your life? No. God's hand is on you. And especially in the midst of dangerous situations, it has to be the hand of God. And for safety of some sort of journey, whether it's a mission trip or some sort of things, we need to fast and pray according to this text. Praying fasting and praying for the children on and on. Okay. Thinking about past four and a half years, five years, it's almost five years now. Five, almost five years of CFC. Okay. We sent four missions teams, and this inner city mission is, I guess, fifth. For five years. And for five years, I mean, I guess more than 100 people went. And every year they go as a pastor. Even though I look like I have a lot of faith, this is what I think all the time. What if one person gets lost in England? Or what if one person gets eaten by <laughs> cannibals or lions or whatever? What if one gets malaria? Anything could happen. I mean, we've been to some countries that were dangerous. Going to uptown is dangerous. And I'll say this without any pride. There was not a single incident. Okay? It's not a single incident concerning accident. But think about it. If one person got sick and something would happen and this rumor spreads all over the cities, no more CFC mission. Nobody would want to send them. I think about that all the time. Because there were a lot of accidents in different kinds of programs. Every time we say something like this, something happens, right? Oh, I never got into an accident. Boom. <laughs> Inner city guys, you better pray a lot this year. What am I saying? We need to pray and fast for safety. That's, that point I just needed to say that for inner city team because I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about you. You better pray. Amen? Who are the inner city guys? Are they here? Number second reason why we need to fast and pray is written in Joel. Okay, Joel chapter 2 is almost toward the end of the Bible. I know it's, it's that page that stick together, you know. After Hosea is Joel. Chapter 2. Verse 12 through 14. Why else do we need to pray? Not only for the safety, but also we need to pray to express repentance okay chapter 2 12 through 14 it says even now declares the lord return to me with all your heart return what does that mean repent turn around from your wicked ways turn around your from your divided heart return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning rend your heart and not your garments return to the lord your god for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger, abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. You, have, you need to repent. Some of you need to repent from different kinds of things. Ones that I talk to and even the ones that want to talk to me, didn't talk to, or ones that don't need to talk to me, that need to talk to God. Need help, I would love to talk to you. You had, as, a, as we were going through Second Samuel, or different kinds of things, some things bothered you, past sins, and a lot of people have talked to me about that so that I can counsel them. I think it has been helpful for a lot of people. It gave them directions what to do till Easter. You have sins to repent. 
you need to fast and pray. Not only some of you think sin is just committing major things and bad things or just these kind of things, but also when we look into this text, it says, return to me with all your heart, meaning if you don't return to me all with all your heart, you're always away from him. <laughs> meaning divided heart, you need to repent. That's a sin before God. Apathy always shows division of your heart. So repentance here is soften your heart to receive forgiveness. Have a broken and contrite heart. And as you fast and repent, fast and pray, Holy Spirit will work asking the Holy Spirit, depending on Him, and He will soften your heart so that you will receive His forgiveness. It's not His problem that He doesn't want to forgive you. It is our problem. Our hearts are hardened. So by praying and fasting as we think about Him and His love and think about the cross and how we have offended God, our hearts will be softened to receive forgiveness from our sins and apathy and divided hearts. Wholeheartedly will we will return to Him, rending our hearts to Him, returning to our God for His gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and He relents from sending calamity. That's why we need to pray. Third reason why we need to pray, not only safety of our well-being, not only to express repentance, but also thirdly, to express urgency. Urgency. Let's turn to Esther chapter 4. You know the chapter. Esther is left of Psalm. Ezra, Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Esther. Chapter 4. You know that Israelites are in danger. Because Mordecai would not bow down to one man, Haman. Haman gets angry in his pride. He wants to exterminate all the Jews. But as we look into this text, Mordecai goes to Esther and says that Esther, queen of the whole Persia, that great kingdom, was she, was she not only beautiful outside but inside. And we see Mordecai, her uh, father figure goes to her and says this in verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Mordecai saying, Esther, you don't listen to God and you don't do something about this. God will save through someone else. But you and your father's family will receive uh, punishment for disobedience. Who knows? It says, Mordecai, Mordecai continues and he says, And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. How do you know for this time, just for this time you have become a queen. The Kassab and hand of God was always there that you became a queen for this time. Esther replies. Verse 15 says, Then Esther sent his reply to Mordecai and says, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Shusha and fast. For me. <laughs> See that? God is saying to us. <laughs> Fast for me. Do not eat, drink for three days. This is a national repentance here. For three days. Do not eat or drink three days, night and day. I and my maids will fast as well. She's not saying, okay, you fast for me. I need to eat for my strength to go to the king. No. That's the excuse I use all the time. You fast and I need strength to pray, uh, preach. Can't do that. But she's saying, I will fast as well. Me and my maid servants. Okay? When this is done, I will go to the king. Even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I'll perish. She needed courage. She needed strength to go to the king. Putting her life on the line. Why? Because it was a national urgency. And in the midst of urgency, we need to fast and pray. Is there any of you who are urgent about something? Okay. Some kind of thing? Or at least you will be in some situation of your life, you'll get into a situation of urgency. That's the time you should fast and pray.
Because when you're urgent, you get hungry. What are you hungry about? You are hungry for God's deliverance, God's power. Hundred times, thousand times more than food. You become hungry when you're urgent. And you express that in fasting and prayer. Lord, I don't even want food. What's more important than food, oh Lord, is you. I need you. You have some kind of urgency, you should fast and pray. Fourth, reason why some of you should fast and pray is to overcome temptation. Overcome temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. As well as Matthew 26, as well as Luke 22, praying that you will not fall into temptation. And we see that in Matthew chapter 4, before Jesus starts a public ministry, he fasts for 40 days and night. No water, no food. And he is strengthened to overcome temptation. He also says later on in ministry, even all the time as we look into the scripture, he prays. And in Gethsemane, where he overcame his desire to be with the Father for eternity, he prays. And he teaches the disciples, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Think about your heart, your situation. Some of you uh, fall into temptation all the time. All the time. What is it? What is your, think about what is your temptation that you cannot say no to? Every one of us have something. What is the temptation that you cannot say no to? You better pray. Fast and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Lord, I need your strength. I need the strength of God. You know when, when you fall? You know when most of you fall? You know when most of you fall? Most of you fall, I think, during vacation time. Summer breaks, winter breaks, spring breaks. Do you know how many people come to me and ask for counseling after winter break, summer breaks, spring breaks? Doing all kinds of things. A lot of time, a lot of people come and say, I have fallen with relationship with my family. Did you pray? No. Did you show respect? No. Did you love them? No. Why? I couldn't. Why? Did you pray? No. A lot of them, a lot of guys come to me and say, I've fallen into the temptation of pornography during the break. I know some of you are addicted to those, that kind of stuff. You know when you fall during the break. Because what a lot of you do is that when you have a school break, you think you have a spiritual break. Break is a time you should pray for the most. When you are not doing anything. If you're studying for the glory of God, that's God's work and you're doing God's work by studying. When you don't study, you are not doing God's work. That's the time when you fall like David. Sexual misconducts, losing virginity, a lot of them after the break. What do you think you are, Superman? If Jesus needed to pray every day, what do you think you are? What do I think I am? In fact, before the break, small groups should, should gather together and fast. Before the break, you, you get your friends together and fast and pray. Can you check me every day? You should pray the most before the break. Before the vacation time. So that you will not fall into temptation. Summer break is coming. 
pray that you will not fall into temptation. Graduates, you know when you're going to fall? Where are the graduates? <laughs> I don't know who's graduating, but... <laughs> you're going to fall not the first year. Because you are so scared now. <laughs> you're planning to do this, you're planning to do that. You're going to apply all the things in, learned in the marketplace Bible study. And gradu me graduation message. Oh, I'm going to be faithful to the death. And the second year, what was the sermon about? Who took my marketplace notes? <laughs> Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Amen? Some of you are saying, why do you talk about all those uncomfortable things? You know why? Because I know you. I know you like I know my hands. <laughs> well, I don't know my hands that well. I know you like I know my family. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I know you. I know college students. I mean, I spend more time with you than anything. Every morning, afternoon, night, I spend time with you. I meet people. When five or six people have the same problem, probably about 50 of them have the same problem. You know what I mean? In a homogenous group like this. And I know you. I know what your problem is. And I care for you. That's why I talk about it. I know your problems, and I care for your problems. Pray that you will overcome temptation. You will not fall into temptation. Pray and fast, especially before the break. You better pray a lot before summer break. It's a long break. You know, by come time, by the, this is a cycle of college ministry. September, oh, let's start with uh, April. Last lock-in or mini Olympics or whatever it is we have, and by the graduation service, <sighs> everybody's so fired up. We're gonna change our church. We're gonna change our home. We're gonna change our city. And you're gonna go on. You are willing to go back home, and you're ready to flip the world upside down with the name of Jesus Christ. And you go forth. And I don't know what happens in between, but you come uh, September. Everybody's saying, man, what did you do back at home? Now there's some hunger, hungering eyes. They're hungry eyes. And I can guarantee you now it's going to be gone by September. Pray that you will not fall into the So, starting September, we have to do it all over again. All over again. I think I'm losing strength now. You got to pray for me. Got to do it all over again, starting with freshmen. By then, you will be sophomores, so I can say it. So, I got to do it all over again. These arrogant kids, they think they're something. Not, not you guys. <laughs> These guys, when they were freshmen, they were like all over again. And time goes, and time goes, and time goes. By winter retreat, a little bit, you know, a little bit there, oil and CFC retreat, a little bit there, and then cleansing, 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 cleansing. By the time you get hungry, you have to go home. <sighs> so the cycle starts over again. Sometimes I, I just check myself, and when does it ever end? You get filled with all kinds of garbage, principles and temptation, false teachings and rumors concerning church or fights or grudges and temptation, sins. <laughs> and we have to do it all over again. Pray a lot, please, before the summer and every day during the summer.
Make sure you be connected to something you're praying with somebody. Everybody said, uh, what is it? Number five? Number five. Fifth reason why we should fast and pray is to receive power. Power. Okay? We're going to look at two passages to see this. And what in the world? Okay? What in the world? How in the world we can receive power? Can we turn to, first of all, uh, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, you know, you know the passage. This is in a context where boys with the evil spirit and disciples, for some reason, a few chapters before they did, they could cast out the demons. But for this chapter here, you know, they can't. They can't cast out demons. So Jesus goes, Oh, you unbelieving generation, how long will I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring that boy over to me. And he casts them out. And the disciples, after they leave in Mark chapter 9, you know, the disciples go, Lord, why, why couldn't we dry up? Look at verse 28. It says, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately because if they don't want to ask, you know, uh, publicly because they're sort of embarrassed. You know? They couldn't do it. So they asked privately. Why couldn't we drive it out, Lord? Just don't say loudly here. Jesus replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. So to receive power to cast out demons, we need prayer. But what does prayer do? Hey, look, at, can, we, can we put your finger there and turn to Matthew chapter uh, 17. Matthew chapter 10. It's the same passage, but instead in this passage is written in some different fashion. It, it's it written in different fashion. Very similar. But look at this. Notice uh, chapter 17 okay, of Matthew. Matthew chapter 17, verse 17. He says the same thing. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I prop with you? Bring the boy here to me. And he cast out, cast them out. Verse 19. Then disciples came, came to Jesus in private and asked, Lord, why, why couldn't we drive it out? Verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. In Mark, it talks, talks something about prayer. Only by prayer that this demon can be cast out, and I guess disciples didn't pray, so they couldn't cast him out. But it, look at it in verse 20, it says nothing about prayer. You know what the scripture is saying? Instead of prayer, what this verse mentioned, verse 20 mentioned, is because you have so little faith. The word faith is mentioned instead of prayer. So it's like John Swanson, if you came to a, a, a all campus worship service, it's similar to what he's saying. Prayer and faith to these uh, biblical writers are almost synonymous. If you, if you pray, you can cast out demons. If you have faith, you can cast out demons. If we pray, what I would say is, if you pray, your faith will grow. So that you can cast out demons. So it's like synonymous term. Do you believe this? I guess it's kind of wrong question to ask if you don't pray. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Do you believe you can cast out demons? And he says, if you believe, you can tell this mountain to move. Faith, in fact, as small as mustard seed can move the mountains do you believe do you believe you can cast out demons move the mountains
Do you believe you can walk on water? Kill the giants. You can. Amen? I'm not sure if you believe that. But if you pray, you can. You are a believer in Jesus Christ. If you really believe that, if you really know that you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and you know that whatever you command is not by your power, but the power of God, you say to this demon, demon, shut up. They'll shut up. Open your mouth. They'll open their mouth. Sit down. They'll try, but they'll sit down. In Jesus' name. Because it's not our power. I'm talking from experiential knowledge here. Mine as well as many, many others. Many, many, countless others. Come out! We'll come out. Why? Because Jesus has a power. And when you pray, you believe Him, His power becomes yours. Hey. When you pray, you'll be able to do that. How many of you want to receive the power of God? How many of you want to really believe that? Let me see hands. I mean, really. Hands high! Put your hand down. How many of you want to really have that kind of power? Let me see hands, please. I mean, really? Raise hand. <laughs> Where does it end, Lord? Where does it end? You pray, you can do that. Number six, sixth reason why we should fast and pray is this. Sixth reason why we should fast and pray is so that we can seek the will of God. Okay? I'll just briefly mention some of these and, and, uh, because for the time's sake. Because we need to seek the will of God. Judges 20, there are 11 tribes fighting against one tribe, Benjamites. Okay? And they outnumbered Benjamites 15 to 1, but they still lose in Judges 20. You know why? Because they didn't pray. 15 to 1. I think about a lot of, lot of people that I know, a lot of them. They have, some of them have incredible records of things. Some of them have incredible GPAs and credentials just can't get jobs or just can't get into school, law school or med school, whatever it is. And then I see some other people who are total underdogs. And I see them get jobs. I see them, God opening the door. God has to open the door. They are faithful to the Lord. And they pray. And I see them. I see God opening the doors. I see, I can mention the names, I will not. I can mention the names of people, many, many people that I know. It's not uncommon. It's like, it's just incredible to see the past graduates of CFC and check how, and how many people do well and how their spiritual life was. It's just incredible to see that. Hey. And when these people lost the battle, 15 to 1, but they still lost the battle, and then they prayed, go, and God, was, God said, go for tomorrow, I will give them into your hands. And when they prayed, God gave them affirmation, and they overcame. Why? They prayed, and they sought the will of God. Okay. And found the answer. Can we turn to Acts? We need to look at this verse. How many of you don't, don't know the will of God? What God wants you to do? What major? Okay. What jobs? You are not positive. You are not sure. You know, you're calling. Acts 
chapter 13, verse 1 through 3. This church didn't know, Paul and Barnabas didn't know what to do, okay, with their life at this moment. Paul, just great apostle, became Paul after these chapters. In this chapter, he's still Saul. Okay? He doesn't know what to do with his life. Look at this church of Antioch, chapter 13. In the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And verse 2, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, what were they doing? Worshiping the Lord and fasting and praying to the Lord. Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. When did the calling come? When they were praying. When they were fasting, verse 3, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Here it talks about great teaching of objective confirmation. Subjectively, we need to, we sense, I feel like this is it, and I enjoy doing this, I think this is it, but also there has to be objective confirmation. Other people like it, you know? Other people affirm it. Especially if it's a call concerning full-time ministry, object to confirmation, church affirming it. Very scriptural. But when did that calling come for Paul and Barnabas? When they were fasting and praying. Every time I talk to students, you know, one consuming, the one thing that I always have to talk about and want to talk about, must talk about, you want me to talk about, is concerning your future. And I ask, how much are you praying? Almost all of you say, I need to pray more. Well, that's what you have to do. I never tell people, almost never tell people, do this. But when I talk to them, I check their subjective and objective confirmation, what they like to do, what they're good at, all these things. And maybe these are some of the choices you should consider. Now you pray. I love to do that. I love to help as, well, as much as I can. But your calling will come hey, when you pray. How many, how many of you are graduating this semester? Let me see your hands. What are you guys sitting in this row? <laughs> Let me see your hands. Hi. Right, stay there. How many of you know what to do after you graduate? Let me see. Put your hand down if you know what to do. <laughs> okay. Oh, for, forget it. Put your hand down. That, I forgot that's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Because that means, oh, I didn't pray. Pastor Min. <laughs> Pastor Min, ask, ask me privately, like the disciple, privately. <laughs> okay, you got to pray. Amen? Pray! Fast! I mean, you're talking about what you're going to do for life. You got to pray fast. How many of you know what major you're going to be in? Let me see here. Among anybody, just anybody, what, what, you, what, you, what your major is, definitely, almost without a shadow of doubt. Less than 50%, I think. Of course, you know, freshmen, of course, much more, but many more, but you got to fast and pray. Amen? Continue to take some classes, but fast and pray. That's why we need to fast and pray. Seventh reason. Why we need to fast and pray. Seventh, last but not least. Can we turn to Luke chapter 2 verse 37? As I mentioned these reasons, whatever catches you, that's what you need to pray for. Okay? Through the night, among other things. Especially... Whatever. Maybe some of you are going, all seven, all seven. <laughs> well, you're going to be here till next year then, praying. Luke chapter 2, verse 37. One more verse and we'll finish up. Okay, we go into prayer. And we see, you know, there's this prophetess Anna. Uh, we read from verse 36. There was also a prophetess Anna, a daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. 
Bible doesn't just say old, but it says very old. That means she's very old. She lived, she had lived with her husband seven years. So maybe if she got, let's say she got married at about 20 or something. She may be married for seven years. So from 27, around 27, or let's say, let's be generous, let's be about 30. Okay? Verse 37, then she was a widow until she was 84. So over 50 years. Verse 30, then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple and worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. 